Ready? Um, could just, okay. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, welcome to the Devolution for the Powers Committee, uh, our seventh meeting. Um, just remind, remind members to switch off their mobile phones. That would be most useful. Um, so can we begin by welcoming our witnesses to the committee this morning? We've got Mary Pitcaithley, who is the Chief Counting Officer, Ian Milton from Grampian Assessors and Electoral Registration Officer, Gordon Blair, Chief Legal Officer from West Lothian Council, and Chris Hycock, from, who is the Senior Deputy Returning Officer in the City of Edinburgh. Now, I don't intend that we'll necessarily direct questions directly to any particular member of the panel, although if members wish to do that, please feel free. Um, and any member of the panel can answer a question, but don't feel you need to answer a question if it's already been posed to you. Um, we've got about an, hour this, just about an hour this morning to go through the business. Um, but I understand Mary McKeithley would like to make a, an opening statement. If that's okay? Yes, yeah, sure. That would be good. Please, Thank you very much. Go. I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank the committee for the opportunity to come along today uh, with the representatives from the EMB um, and to reflect uh, with you on the experience of the referendum before it all goes to the back of our minds. Um, I think there are three points that um, I want to make at this point which hopefully will frame the discussions. One is that we talk a lot about the scale of the event that we had in September and quite frankly it was just huge in every, in every uh, aspect. But it did go well, um, and we think the reason it went well was because of the planning, the professionalism, and the hard work of the many dedicated people across Scotland who work in election teams and who um, help and support us to do the job that we were given. But I also wanted to recognise the contribution that this committee made. Your scrutiny of the referendum legislation was vital in shaping the rules and the approach. And in particular, we obviously welcomed the long lead-in period to allow us to do that planning that we think is so important. So it was um, the biggest ever electoral event in Scotland in terms of turnout, in terms of electorate, in terms of the number of postal voters, but also the biggest in terms of media interest, public engagement in the debate, and obviously in terms of the, the gravity of the question that was being asked of us. It was an event that uh, went well. Um, it's satisfying for us to be able to look back on the months of planning, preparation and work with stakeholders and know that we achieved the objective we set out to achieve, which was that voters would have confidence in the result. Um, that's not just my assessment. We've obviously got the Electoral Commission report, but we've, we've been speaking with those representing the campaign groups and the political parties, with the press, with international observers and with Scotland's voters, most of whom have commented on how well uh, the referendum was run. And it was an event that um, we didn't rush, so we had time because of the, the um, early um, passing of the legislation. We had time to develop and implement structures and controls to ensure that we would have the highest standards in terms of this uh, electoral event. Um, and that was something that was really important. For us, it was um, an example of a referendum which was made in Scotland and delivered by our unique institutions with the Electoral Management Board for Scotland having an important role. As Chief Counting Officer, my position as convener of the EMB meant that I could call on the support, expertise and professional resources of the entire board. Our project management approach is already being promoted across the UK as a case study and model of best practice in how to plan, manage and deliver major, major electoral events with a clear objective, principles and appropriate controls. Of course, while that is important for Scotland, we are not complacent and we are already learning the lessons of 2014 to continue to improve our own performance in future. And finally, I would simply note that although there were many challenges facing us in delivering this referendum, and I'm sure we'll come back to the issues around turnout and around the extension of the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds, but with extensive planning and with the engagement of all the professionals in the 32 council election teams within Scottish Government, within the Electoral Commission and uh, colleagues in Police Scotland, we were able through consensus, guidance and a handful of directions to craft a framework that ensured that polling and counting went smoothly right across the country. Thank you. Thank you very much for that opening statement, Mary. I, I think it's probably appropriate at this stage on behalf of the committee and hopefully I'm sure on behalf of the whole Parliament to thank you uh, as the Chief Counting Officer for Scotland, the electoral officials who were involved in the process across Scotland for the organisation of the referendum for your hard work, your professionalism. I know 
the long hours were certainly part of the situation you were involved in. It took a huge commitment to deliver what I think has been widely recognised, you have said yourself, a remarkably successfully organised referendum um, where the people of Scotland immersed themselves in democracy. So, and I think probably we have enabled ourselves through not just both governments, the parliament, this committee and yourselves to show uh, something pretty significant in terms of how democ democratic societies can work. And I think it has been a model that the rest of the world can learn from. So I am very grateful to you for that basis. Now, in your opening statement, Mary, you talked about the need and time to develop structures and controls and learning lessons. And therefore, I would like to just begin with one of the areas where we might need to start using some of these lessons quite quickly, and that is in regard to 16 and 17 year olds um, and the uh, proposed section 30 that has been discussed between the two governments. Now, all things being equal, um, and I, in an ideal world, when do you think that section 30 needs to be in place, and when do you think this? Parliament needs to put the legislation in place to make sure we develop these controls and structures that you talked about to enable 16 and 17 year olds to successfully take part in the, refer re the I to say referendum. It was a slip of the tongue. The Scottish Parliament elections in 2016. Well, we are very fortunate in that we do know the date of the, of the Scottish Parliament elections. That's really helpful because all of our planning can then take place within a, a set period. And the answer really is as soon as possible, and certainly not later than the spring of, of 2015. Um, and there are a variety of reasons for that which my colleagues can expand upon. There are two aspects to successfully extending the franchise. I think one of them is getting young people actually on the register so that they can vote. And my colleague Ian Milton can expand on um, what the timescales would be for him in terms of his responsibilities as an ERO. The other aspect of that is, of course, those young people wanting to be on the register and wanting to then go and use their vote. So around that, the issues were around voter education, but also using um, Education Scotland, our, our own education teams within the council, community education, whatever, whatever resources were available to us, young Scot, everything, to try and reach out to young people and, and, and engage with them. Now, those were remarkably successful. Successful, but it will be a whole new group of 15 and 16-year-olds, uh, 16 and 17-year-olds rather, come 2016. So we really will have to redouble those efforts, I think. But I think we've cracked it. We know what worked, and so I think we can revisit some of those things. When I know your committee was uh, worked, worked closely with the Scottish Government um, and, and agencies about that as well. But within the councils, we did quite a lot, and we can keep that moving and then re-engage with that particular cohort of 16 and 17 year olds in the registration period to get them, to get them on board. But in terms of the specifics of registration, pro probably best if I leave it to, to Ian to pick those up. Certainly. The, um, the position regarding, um, if we look at the experience that we had for the referendum, uh, the Franchise Act uh, uh, came through with Royal Assent in August uh, 2013. Uh, for the um, uh, canvas, which commenced um, on 1st of Oct October uh, 2013. Now, the, that didn't meet the six-month rule that Gould set down, but we had actually electoral registration officers had been in discussion uh, with Scottish government for a considerable period before then. So, in that respect, um, electoral registration officers knew where they were going. But ideally, uh, the re legislation, if you were going to follow the six-month rule, would need to be in place by 1st of February 15, uh, because the, ca the canvas will start from 1st of uh, August 15. That's yeah, uh, uh, interesting, because I recognise from the Electoral Commission's report, which came out last, this week, yes. the beginning this week, came on that Tuesday. they certainly talked about six months before the canvas having to have all legislation commenced. But it was Gould not six months before the actual event that the legislation had to be in place? Well, the, the, the event is the canvas. But, but it, I'm, I'm pretty sure Gould was pretty specific that it was about the election date and six months before it, and, and the Electoral Commission have gone further. Now, I may be wrong, and I stand to be corrected, 
No, but I think you're quite right, Convener. I think it was six months before the event. Everything should be in place, yeah. not just the legislation, but hopefully all the regulations that flow yeah. from those as well. I think Ian's point is simply that for him, the event isn't polling day, yeah, okay. but the, the canvas that, in, you know, that, that is when you capture those voters. So okay. ideally, you would, want, you would want the full six months for that as well. Okay. In, in planning for your canvas, you need to know what questions you want, you're asking and who you're asking those questions from. So to do that, uh, to get your forms designed and printed and uh, make, make sure all your contracts are in place, make sure your response service is in place if you're going to use automated response or electronic response services, these all have to be designed in advance of the canvas actually being launched. So the event, as far as the canvas is concerned, is in fact, uh, it starts in the autumn. Some EROs might start on the 1st of August, others might start on 1st of September or thereabouts. But that's when the canvas starts, and that's when the documentation will be arriving on people's doorsteps. Well, interesting challenge we've got here. Yes. <laughs> because uh, August, you say the canvas will be for the 2016 election, all right? Yes. And so it's got to be in place six months before. We're talking about then, in effect, in February. First of February. So. We need to, not only do we have to have the Section 30 order um, passed at Westminster, we've got to get the legislation through here yeah. by February. Well, in I an ideal world. Yeah, <laughs> that's <laughs> interesting. I think we should see, yeah. I okay. mean, I, you know, I think we absolutely would want to stick with the Gould um, principles around this. Um, but, you know, if we do know that something is coming and we are absolutely clear that it's going to be approved, then you know, that makes a big difference. Obviously, the, the Gould experience back in 2007 was around legislation that you could have no certainty about at all. It was changing quite significantly right up until about three months or so before polling day. Right. OK, we now know we don't have the ideal world. <laughs> so what is, what, and what time scale is it doable? is the next question that needs to be asked in that case. Well, I think you need to look at the experience that we had. Um, we've demonstrated that we can do it. We've demonstrated that we can make sure that 16 and 17 year olds are enfranchised uh, without the legislation in place until August. So I suppose uh, anything better than that is an improvement. Okay. And, and, and a step in the right direction. But you can handle August with anything <laughs> better than that. So that's quite an important message actually in terms of yeah. how we take I, this forward. So. What, what is most important is that there is uh, very close working, as there was for the referendum, between officials like myself and, uh, and the policy makers uh, and the Scottish Government. Uh, and we had a referendum focus group that met informally uh, uh, and, and that worked extremely well between officials and Scottish Government yeah. and people like myself. So, uh, so that meant that when the, uh, the, final, the legislation finally was enacted, uh, we were all up and running. But in an ideal world, uh, you know, you'd want the legislation first, but as we've acknowledged. Well, I guess you'll now be talking to the Scottish Government officials sometime next week to begin to discuss how well, this can be put together. We have, I'm, I'm sure that, another I'm, day next I'm sure that's already happened. <laughs> the, the approach has already been made. Okay, I, I'm sure that's right. I, I think Stuart Miller had a, a supplementary in this area. It's okay at the moment, thank you, Convener. Lewis. Thanks, that was very helpful and uh, I'd echo uh, the convener's opening remarks. I think I'm sure we all would in terms of the conduct and success of the operation uh, and, and recognising the scale of it as well. When it comes to lessons learned, clearly there are a number of, of, of areas that are important and uh, I wonder in terms of the joint working, I think Mary mentioned in, in your opening statement, uh, joint working with the Electoral Commission and Police Scotland, they are clearly important uh, partners uh, and I noticed Neil Milton's uh, report a number of queries over some of those uh, working uh, relationships and uh, particularly around things the Electoral Commission notified to voters which were perhaps not as helpful as, as, as you felt they might have been uh, and also the question without obviously going into any individual cases, but the question of whether Police Scotland took attempted electoral fraud as seriously as they ought to have done. So I'd be interested uh, in your comments on, on, on those broad areas in terms of working with other, uh, other agencies. 
Uh, I can pick up on the second point in relation to yeah. the police. I mean, I would say that in the experience we had of dealing with um, the police service generally, and specifically the, the senior officers who were uh, working directly with us, was uh, one of the best experiences I've had of partnership working. Um, we had very clear lines of communication. We had access to the most senior officers if we had specific concerns. And we planned the whole um, approach uh, from very early on with regular meetings. Um, I was still meeting with um, Jim Baird, who was the chief superintendent we were working with right up until uh, polling day. In fact, he was at the count. So, you know, it was, it was a, a, a long uh, lead-in period for us to get to know each other and to understand what the important issues were. So I have no doubt that those officers have absolute um, clarity around the importance of pursuing um, potential uh, cases of electoral fraud. Um, they obviously have to work closely with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and I know that in relation to a number of cases uh, evidence gathering is still going on. So it may be that people get a wee bit frustrated that it looks as though there were cases on the day but what's happened to them, my understanding is they may still be trundling through the system but you know, they were certainly taken up with, every, um, with, with the degree of um, interest that I would have expected. Thanks. In relation to the report, perhaps if I could actually contextualise my report, uh, this report wasn't written as a, a piece of evidence uh, for this committee. This report was written as, a, as an overview um, uh, which, which went to a number of sources. It was to inform the Electoral Commission, it was to inform uh, academic organisations that were interested in the referendum, it was to uh, rec record the position as far as electoral registration officers across Scotland were concerned um, and, uh, and it's been used in a variety of um, forum. For that reason I apologise because uh, at times I, I start talking about R-11 and E-6 and all sorts of things but they're, they're just electoral administrator's terms and maybe when you've been in amongst electoral administrators as much as I have then you, you start to take on these things which is, a, which is possibly regrettable. Um, so. Uh, at, and, and, and at times the report is possibly a touch frank in the sense that uh, it does highlight specific incidents. But uh, what, what I would point people to is the opening paragraph, sure. which is sure. the most successful uh, you know, sure. electoral event ever uh, in, in, a, in the experience of electoral registration officers in the committee. But uh, it, nevertheless, we need to pick up on uh, Points where we can, pinch points where we can improve, and that's what the report really set out to do. It, was, it wasn't really, it shouldn't be seen as, as a critical report, it's more a case of where we go forwards. Uh, absolutely, and that was, and hence, hence the contextualisation of my question as well, recognising the fantastic success of the operation as a whole, but, but, but pursuing those particular points. And, and I guess if the principle you were outlining in relation to 16 and 17 year old franchise was a principle of no surprises and you can do it. Um, if, that's, if that's an accurate summary of, of, of what you're saying there. I guess also in relation to advertising or promoting of opportunities for voters by the Electoral Commission, it is also presumably about using the experience of the referendum Absolutely. in order to better inform how they make uh, known to the public how to proceed. Uh, is that uh, also essentially what your Absolutely, point yeah. is to do. I mean, we, we do work extremely closely with, with the Edinburgh office and also the London office of the Electoral Commission, so uh, we have very good lines of communication. I think it's a very good point that we had so many first-time voters, and yep. they weren't all 16 or 17-year-olds no, no, by any manner no, no. of means, mm -hmm. um, or indeed people who had, maybe hadn't voted for a long time. And I think what we perhaps... Uh, one of the lessons learned is that we need to go into a lot more detail than perhaps we had anticipated, and I mean we, all of us, and the media as well, because we've spoken with the media about this as well, in terms of just exactly what happens in a polling station, what should happen, what's your, what will you expect, so that we could have demystified the whole issue of pencils, for example, which bedeviled us right up until polling day. Um, or, and also the other end of that is, in all honesty, in my entire life as a, as a returning officer, no one's ever been interested in the count other than people like us. But the, the um, interest, the levels of interest in the minutia of what happens in the count was great. I mean, it's fabulous. But there are so many people you can't sit down and explain it to at the time. We all issued um, booklets that were available in the count so that you had an explanation. 
But if you were just watching it on TV, it must have still seemed a bit mysterious. So I think one of the lessons for us there is just to take a wee bit more time to actually explain what happens, what are the various stages, why do you verify as well as count, what's yeah. that all about, you know. Yeah, okay. That's very helpful. I've got a couple of supplementaries here. Linda was first, then Mark, and Stuart as well, but I need to... Yes, I'll push on. Just a wee comment about what Mary has just said. You know, I think you know, extend that um, awareness raising to how to register and things like that as well, if you're missed, because we certainly locally came across some confusion there. Right, I was wanting to <clears throat> ask Ian a bit more just on, on this issue and, um, about the register for young voters, um, because in the SAA um, submission, there is both explicitly and implicitly, uh, the view that it could have been done better and that perhaps there was complications. Is there the ability to rationalise some of that in terms of the, the different register, the Confidential Young Voters Register and the other one? And, and how do you do that, making sure that you're not um, creating potential vulnerabilities uh, for those who will in fact be 15 at the time of registration and become as attainers. Yes, I mean, that's a fascinating uh, mm -hmm. point. Um, in democracy, you've always got this tension between privacy and transparency. And no, it, it's illustrated absolutely with great clarity with young voters. Mm -hmm. And really, there is no magic solution to this. It is complicated because electoral law is complicated. It's not an administrative issue. Um, we rationalised as much as we could, but it, it is nevertheless complicated. For example, um, an application received um, by an electoral registration officer uh, before 1st of December 15 in this canvas that will happen next autumn will allow an 18-year-old, sorry, an under 18-year-old to be registered, providing they are 18 by 30th of November 2016. And they'll be shown on the electoral register as an attainer, and they'll be shown with their name, and they'll be shown with their 18, the date of their 18th birthday. Mm -hmm. Now, if the application was received the following day, on the 1st of December 2015, then the we can show the individual as an attainer with their 18th birthday, as long as that 18th birthday is on or before 30th of November 2017. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is where the issue arises, because there's no electoral law as it stands just now. It's not a case of saying, well, if your date of birth is before that date, mm -hmm. you're going to be an attainer on the electoral register. Uh -huh. And if your date of birth is before that date, then... Uh, the other way around. Because it will depend on when the, the application is actually received by the electoral registration officer. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that is in the Representation of the People Act, 1983. So it's a fundamental piece of legislation mm -hmm. uh, that drives uh, electoral law across the United Kingdom. And the question is, um, can that be rationalised? Can um, what was put in place under the Franchise Act for 16 and 17 year olds, bearing in mind that there's the issue of 15 year olds um, being noted, can that be rationalised? Well, it, 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 it is to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in, a, in essence, we will be capturing data for 14 year olds as well as 15 year olds right, right. for the same reason as we capture at present data for 16 and 17 year olds mm -hmm. uh, for our existing registers. Uh, and I think the other thing we need to bear in mind is that this is going to be an ongoing process, yeah. not just for the Scottish parliamentary election, mm -hmm. because after all, if there's a Scottish parliamentary election where the franchises of 16 and 17 year olds uh, are enfranchised, then it will apply to any by-elections. Uh -huh. So it's going to have yeah. to become part of business as usual uh -huh. in the electoral administration and registration front. And that's where a challenge lies. Mm -hmm. um, the, I think the, one of the issues about the polling list and the electoral register was obviously the, polling, uh, sorry, the, the young voters register was confidential. And so it meant that um, 
designated organizations, the two designated organizations had access to it mm -hmm. through the polling list, but the permitted participants didn't. Mm -hmm. And you, you get into issues about um, transparency. Folks, I don't want to stop no, that discussion, fine. but we are getting very deep here. Mm -hmm. and there's quite a yeah. range of areas we're going to have to cover, and we might not get through what we need to get to. But Mark and Stuart have said that it's quick supplementary. Oh. <coughs> I, I, I will be brief, convener. Um, it, it was just around the, the points that, that Mary Pitt Casely was raising about doing more to inform voters about the processes. Now, I remember in 2007 when we did the first STV uh, council elections, there were um, specific officials at polling stations who were there to guide folk through the process and explain what was happening now. Obviously there, there were added complications in terms of multiple voting systems on the same day, whereas what we had here was a binary, uh, a binary ballot, but at the same time, as, as you identify, large numbers of people who'd never cast any form of ballot in their life. With hindsight, do you think having those kind of desks in polling stations might have been a, a move to make? I know you've said there were no delays or anything like that, but certainly when I was going around polling stations in my constituency, staff were saying that they felt it was a bit onerous having to both issue ballot papers, but at the same time offer guidance and advice to people who might require it. It's a fine balance because it's the simplest ballot paper, if you like. If you think of all the different kinds of ballot papers, it was nice and simple, straightforward, <coughs> um, and you know, it, normally you would be expecting a, a polling, a presiding officer and a polling clerk to be able to deal with that. But we recognised early on that we had to plan for a very large turnout. And because of that, we restricted the number of people who could use each polling station. We asked um, counting officers to have no more than 800 people use it, electors potentially using a, a polling station um, at any, you know, on, on the day um, to try and uh, prevent queues. Now, we were successful in preventing queues. The only time I saw any queues were before 7 in the morning, which was mm -hmm. great, but, you know, it wasn't a queue because of any slow um, responses from staff. That was fine. During the day, I had no complaints about queuing, but I recognised that some stations were busy. And I certainly would recognise that POs and clerks on the day didn't really get much of a break. They did work pretty much full on. And for that reason, most accounting officers did employ additional staff. Now, they weren't necessarily called information officers, but they were there to provide additional capacity to let somebody you know, have, a, have a sandwich for lunch or have a of a comfort break or whatever, but also to be there to help people. So if somebody did come in and was utterly confused or just wanted to ask a lot of questions, they could take them off to one side. So I certainly saw that as I went around some polling stations working quite well. And I know that in polling stations where with the late surge in applications for people to register, the 800 was breached because more than 800 on that particular list for that polling place. Um, the, the response from the counting officer at that stage could only be to put in more staff, and that was what I think tended to happen. I don't know if Chris wants to say anything about the experience in Edinburgh, for example. I think the experience in Edinburgh, as, as Mary was saying, that one of the key things we were doing was training all polling staff. And we, we've given the, the submission there, example, a polling station handbook that was given to all, all polling staff, and that went through in detail what the process was that a voter would engage in when they came into a polling place. All staff were aware that there were going to be a lot more people engaging in the process in, in voting than normal. And certainly in the face-to-face -face training that we all gave to all our polling staff, that was a particular challenge we wanted to, them to pick up on. We also looked at this in the round. We're not the only ones that are communicating with, with the voters. Um, the Electoral Commission material went to every household in, in, in the country and explained, explained the process. But certainly there's a, there's a key role that the, 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 polling, the polling clerk and the presiding officer have in guiding people through, through the voting process, and we, we do recognise that and build on that. G given that we're going to have three elections in the next three years, each using different ballot papers and different electoral systems, um, do you think having something in place at polling stations uh, would be advisable, given the high turnout we've seen and that many of the people who voted for the very first time in the referendum we would hope would continue to vote, but they'll be voting in different ways? I think having three people in a quiet polling station where there aren't that many voters assigned to that polling station um, and where the turnout may not be at the same level as we had in September um, could be seen to be a potential um, waste of, of public money. So even if the fees and charges order allowed for it, there could be criticism of three people sitting all day with you know, maybe no more than a couple of hundred voters. 
you know, assigned to that polling station. So I think it should be left as horses for courses. I think it should be about having a very close look at what's the likely turnout in an area, what's been the previous experience, um, how well, you know, is it a community where there might be lots of young people voting for the first time, for example, or is it, um, is it something where we think the two staff can cope? I think we should be, there should be some flexibility around having a look at it closer to the time. Edinburgh responded right up until, uh, you know, putting additional staff in right up until a day or two before polling day. Do you Thank you. Um, the 16 and 17 year olds who obviously have gone on to register for the first time, but those who were not in education, those who were actually doing apprenticeships, how did you manage to actually get information to them to get them registered? So I know that was a point I raised when we went through the, the, the legislation. The Franchise Act required uh, election registration officers to issue uh, a young voter registration form to every household in Scotland as part of the canvas. So that was, uh, that was the, the principal data capture uh, method. But we, uh, we um, uh, also used, obviously, the education authorities. Uh, but to deal with the apprentices, we also dealt with Scottish Youth Parliament and other other fora to try and uh, get the message across. We also work with colleges of FE or whatever their current title is because I lose track. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, further education, tertiary education establishments, uh, not only just universities but colleges as well. So uh, we, we, we were getting the message out as strongly as possible. Uh, the Electoral Commission did a lot of work on that as well. Uh, and um, so we feel confident that we had managed to capture um, as many as we possibly could and in that respect we also worked with people uh, like the care providers for dealing with looked after children um, and that raises all sorts of issues uh, but uh, that was a success as well in, in my assessment. Okay, thank you. Could I just add very briefly on that um, as part of our duty to encourage participation which technically I suppose applies to elections but we applied it to the referendum and would certainly apply it to 2016. West Lothian, my council, not alone in this by any means, had awareness raising sessions with our West Lothian College for the younger uh, voters, and particularly the 16 and 17 year old employees in the county, my own council, being the biggest employer in the area. So there were specific measures taken to target 16 and 17 year olds uh, in our area, and, and, and other councils will be doing uh, the same. And on a more general point, uh, uh, depending on resources, and resources are, are not the same everywhere, of course, uh, S4 and S5 in secondary schools were targeted specifically for awareness raising. And that's not just to get yourself registered through our ERO colleagues, but also the voting process. So we can improve on that, but of course that is resource intensive and obviously uh, in the current climate that's a problem but we would hope and I'm sure other councils uh, will be trying to do the same to repeat that for 2016 to capture the, the new 16 and 17 year old voters. I have to say I think the media did a great job as well though. They really, we, you know, we had great support from um, media um, who were looking for us to do interviews. My quid pro quo was always well the message I want you to get out then is around trying to avoid queuing by turning up at a certain time, getting to young voters about the dead deadline for voting, etc. Et so there was always a, a bit of a trade-off in terms of using their ability to be able to reach out to people that, that might, we might not be able to get to. Alison, you're in, I think, a question in this sort of area as well, so probably now is a chance to get... Um, you know. Yeah, thanks very much. And I too would like to congratulate you all on your, your contribution to the most successful electoral event ever. And um, I'm also pleased to note, Mr Milton, that we're not expected to understand all the jargon in, <laughs> in your report. I was reading that thinking, oh, should, should I know what R11 is? Um, my, my questions probably are for Mr Milton in particular. Um, you... Note that deadlines for registration and for absent vote applications immediately prior to the referendum were too late and too inconsistent, and you're obviously concerned about the impact that might have in future elections. Um, and I know you also say that policymakers might be loath to interfere and change that in any way. I just wondered if you'd like to make further comment on what we might do and the problems that presented. Um, certainly. The, the deadlines for registration and the deadlines for absent vote applications um, are, are um, really considered 
uh, by administrators to be um, fairly cast iron in that I, I believe they, they lie in, uh, you know, they're well embedded in legislation. So the deadline for registering to vote is 12 days before the electoral event, but it's midnight, whereas the deadline for making an absent vote application is 11 days before the electoral event, but it's 5 p.m. Okay. And then the deadline for uh, a proxy, this didn't apply in the referendum particularly, but in electoral law, the deadline for making an application for a proxy vote is normally uh, midnight on day six, and then uh, for an emergency proxy is 5 p.m. on the day. So you have this midnight deadline or 5 p.m. and it depends on what event you're working towards. So ideally, all, of the, all the time deadlines, if they were all brought to either noon of that day, which would mean that any form has been delivered or handed in, would be handed in to offices that were being manned and, uh, and also people who were handing them in could get an assurance with, that's the form handed in, yes, we've received it in time, mm -hmm. or rather than popping it through a letterbox at 11.59 at night and yeah. wondering whether it's going to be accepted. So there's mm -hmm. a time issue. Um, and then the, uh, the, the question over the deadlines being too close to the election is a real challenge. Um, the Political uh, um, Constitution Reform Committee in the House of Commons has recently published a voter engagement report, its fourth report, uh, just earlier, earlier last month, and that stated that they want to see deadlines brought uh, close to the electoral event to increase en engagement. And the uh, Electoral Commission, in its report on a referendum, commented along similar lines that, it was a, that maybe deadlines should be brought closer to the uh, electoral event. But that creates huge difficulties <coughs> for administrators. Um, and uh, especially now that we're actually in a different registration framework than we had for the referendum. Because now we're in the individual electoral registration framework, which is a completely uh, new, if you like, filter to electoral registration. And it means that uh, each application not only has to be received by the ERO, but also has to be verified through a verification process that can take up to five days. Okay. I mean, we did keep offices open until midnight, and returning officers were trying to give as much support to EROs as possible, seconding staff if that was appropriate, helping with call centres, etc. But it would make such a difference if there was a specific time. And I think for the voter, it would ease the, the concern they might have as to whether or not their application was valid. Because an awful lot of time the next day was spent dealing with people who were phoning up to say, did you get it? And actually, that was the same day as we were dealing with the very last day for applying for a, an absent vote, for applying for a postal vote. And the two were too close, to, are too close together. Yes. But at least the second date was a five o'clock deadline. You could sort of close the door and say, well, if it's not in, it's not in. The, with the, the, the day before, with no time specified and having to therefore assume it's midnight, it really isn't. It's not, it's not good for the voter. And to be honest, um, there are some people who just always leave things till the last minute. I don't think you would have lost many voters. They would have just got it in at 5 to 12 during the day rather than at 5 to midnight. And, you know, I think it would be a huge uh, improvement if we put uh, times that are, that are in the, the normal working day. I mean, that, noticing, noticing that the, uh, the law commissions of England and, and Scotland are considering the entire um, set of electoral legislation at the moment. And one of the things that we've been appealing for is, is consistency in, in the timetable and making sure that that's reviewed and, and looked at very clearly. But also, just to be positive about it, you know, we, we do deal with that timetable and the key thing for ourselves is just to know what those dates are and to communicate those clearly and make sure that people can, can work within them. Yeah. Supplementary to that? Yeah. And then, then I'll come to Rob and then Lewis. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do, you, you, you've answered that very clearly, and it doesn't seem beyond the wit of man to, to address this issue sensibly. Um, just, it sounds, you know, if, if there's a feeling that deadlines should be brought closer to electoral events, we're clearly going to have to look at resourcing and capacity. Um, but it also said in your report that in some areas, third parties claiming to promote engagement submitted volumes of applications yes. um, on behalf of the lectors. Yes. What was going on there? Um, there's, there's a number of um, uh, organisations uh, that are in, interested in political engagement. And whether they have a 
particular, particular agenda or not is not for me to, to question. And in, in a way, any engagement activity is to be welcomed because, uh, and certainly in this referendum, there was massive engagement, which was absolutely fantastic. Uh, but what can happen is that um, uh, some organizations might uh, decide that they're going to have a registration drive in a particular locality. And they will go around with a form. They'll have maybe picked my fo the form that my office issue uh, from my website, or they'll have maybe downloaded one from the Electoral Commission website, photocopied it numerous times, and then uh, gone round on, on to doorsteps and invited people to register to vote. Now, uh, as long as those forms are properly completed and are signed and are returned to us by the deadline, they are valid applications to register to vote. The problem is that every form that I received like that in my office was for somebody who was already registered to vote. So, but it was a fresh application, so it had to be processed. We had to reference it up, work out the address, because sometimes the address wasn't, they didn't give the tenement flat location, so we'd have to work out, you know, they maybe gave the, the house number, but not the uh, tenement flat location. So there was time, administrative time spent working out which property record this application referred to and then finding that the person was already registered and uh, so that tied up a resource. Yeah. One office received about 500 applications uh, just before midnight on day 11, sorry on day 12 and each one of those applications had to be considered and established whether there was a registration already in place or if not was it a valid registration and if so they should be added to the register. Well, I'll have to move on from this bit, Ian. Um, I've, got, I've got Robin Lewis who want to ask some supplementaries in this area, but I must get to the issue of costs because that matters to you folks. And I'm going to come to Stuart Maxwell after I've loaded these two supplementaries. Yeah, thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, you were talking about the burdensome, particularly burdensome nature of registration hearings and appeals, which we've been exploring just now. And you mentioned, of course, that we're in a new system. Um, and indeed, it looks to me as though if there's any query about an application for a postal vote, that the deadline is 12 days before uh, the, the person has to re reply. Uh, and, you know, this makes it uh, unlikely that you would be able to handle such things if they were late applications uh, at midnight uh, or at noon the following day. Can you comment a little further on that? Yes, once an application is received, if it's received in time, uh, but there are questions to be raised, uh, to be clarified, uh, maybe the uh, correspondence address for the ballot paper isn't very clear, then we will follow that up and we will get to the bottom of it and the, the application will not be treated as uh, void. Uh, but it all takes a significant amount of time. Uh, in the case of hearings, this is to do with a, a registration application which the ERO um, has concerns about, uh, concerns about the veracity possibly uh, uh, of the application. So uh, just before an election, when you receive maybe several thousand applications, 11 days, sorry, 12 days beforehand, and you find you have uh, a number of those that you actually uh, are unhappy with, uh, then you will call a hearing and that all takes time. Now, if you've got one or two hearings, that's quite easy to deal with. But if you're moving into double figures to allocate a day in that short period between registration deadline of day 12 and determination deadline of day 6, then uh, you've only got that window to actually operate in and to get the applicant to, to acknowledge receipt of the hearing notice and... Uh, be available for the hearing all takes time and resources. So, um, and normally it's not, a, it's not a major issue. The level of engagement in the referendum and also um, I think the uh, desire for people who were maybe not resident in Scotland to nevertheless participate because they consider themselves to be Scots led to a number of what I consider to be fraudulent applications which required a hearing. But do you think there's going to be a knock-on effect because of the way in which the new letters are written in a fashion which uh, gives the uh, applicant 12 days to respond uh, with the information that's required 
if, to confirm their identity in order that they can get a postal vote. How can that possibly work? Because people have work uh, reasons, there's distance, there's getting to offices, there's a lot of different ways in which, you know, the ordinary voter might be put off from taking part in this. Mm. Is it likely that people will actually be put off from registering because of the complexity of the way in which this is now being run? Right. In, in relation to individual electoral registration, I'm not familiar with which letter you're referring to. Well, it's a letter which uh, I happen to have uh, been sent because they said that they couldn't uh, verify my identity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> to confirm now you are wrong. <laughs> and the language is threatening and the, it has been evolved by the, the Electoral Commission, I understand that, not yourselves, but the timings are really difficult and it's, it's the ongoing thing that's going right. to happen for I, I the think, next I think this, 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 this is a, a slightly different issue but it's, it's, a, it's a very key point. Uh, individual electoral registration, if, if Chair has time, was rolled out at first of, well, 19th September in Scotland with EROs having to write out uh, to every elector um, from the 1st of October this year. The vast majority of electors received a letter from an electoral registration officer telling them that they had been confirmed and that they need to take no further action and that they were on the electoral register and they were on the open register or they weren't on the open register. Post-referendum, you don't mind me saying so, but we could pick up on some of these issues in writing to you because they're obviously yeah. quite important. Very and important. Well, Very and, important. And, and because I, I recognise the significance of them, so we need to have an exchange about it. We'd be very happy to purposes. do that. Lewis, and then I'll go to Stuart Maxwell. One area around registration which may be affected by individual electoral registration, um, but was a concern in the referendum, was university students returning to their city of study immediately before the referendum and discovering that they'd uh, ceased to be registered even if they hadn't actually moved their term time address. Is that an issue which ha is already being addressed? Is that something that uh, registration officers are aware of and, and what can be done to deal with it in future terms? Yes, we were very aware that the timing of the referendum did not really fit in to the uh, university timetable whatsoever and I prepared a report that was put to the EMB uh, that really informed a, a lot of administrators on where we were going with that. Uh, it was a unique situation with the referendum taking place on the 18th of September sure. which coincided almost with most freshers weeks and so there's a lot of work done with NUS, with the universities, a lot of messaging done through Electoral Commission so um, and I'm pleased to say uh, that the feedback has been positive, that those that were entitled to participate did and those that weren't didn't. So in that regard, um, that I think was a success. Um, the uh, issue going forwards with individual electoral registration is a different issue. There's no timing issue uh, with re regard to uh, the uh, Scottish parliamentary election. So that isn't an issue, but there is, there is an issue about how we register students in future and we're working on that with NUS and academic registrars uh, just now. Thank you very much. Sure, uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, can I turn to a different area? Um, it's in the, it really dealt with in the final paragraphs of Mr Milton's uh, uh, submission um, about the costs that um, have been estimated at £700,000 of additional costs in order to prepare and, and, and run the referendum. Could you maybe um, explain to us in a little detail um, how you came to that figure? Um, because, of course, what, as, as my understanding is it's costs that, should be, that are reasonably incurred which are additional to those which are expected to be incurred. Can you maybe take us through how you came to that figure? Certainly. Uh, the, the additional costs, as, if, if we look at a normal electoral event to start with, electoral registration officers are maintaining their registers year-round. It's within their budget to maintain the registers. And uh, a normal electoral event uh, will be um, a Scottish parliamentary election or a UK parliamentary election. And our resources will normally cover that. We don't normally need any additional funds. But this referendum was so unique that it demanded huge additional resources 
to be put into in a reactive manner because it's a whilst you can plan for the event and plan for high levels of engagement, what you cannot necessarily do is forecast how many phone calls and emails you're going to receive and how many people are going to change their voting preferences as, a, as opposed to absent vote to voting in person then maybe changing their mind back again. And all these different aspects which were almost unique due to the level of engagement that we experienced. And in my own office, um, an electoral event will pass with virtually no additional hours being worked by my staff. We're organized to deal with it. Mm -hmm. in, my, in my office this time, uh, we worked more than 2,700 hours, additional hours, uh, to try and deal with the huge volumes of interest. Uh, and many of these were just phone calls or emails saying, am I on the register? or um, I've got my absent vote, what do I do now? And many of them flowed between registration and returning or, or counting officer, but they've made the call, we're not going to pass them on to another office, we'll deal with it. Eric, can you expand on it from your perspective? Um, yes, I mean, I think um, the additional staff we put into polling stations as the uh, registration numbers um, increased significantly, the additional um, work we had to do on polling day, the number of emergency proxy applications, for example, was way beyond anything we've ever experienced. So that went on all during the day. Those are the sorts of things that we hadn't um, necessarily been able to anticipate. So, you know, we, we, the counting officers are currently making, preparing their claims um, for the, the re, re, their expenses, but you know that will that will feed through, and we'll be able to give a full explanation for any additional costs uh, over and above uh, what's allowed for. Um, but it, it's those sorts of things. If you're just looking for a flavour of it, that's the kind of thing that happened. You know, we, and it was about scale, really, as much as anything else, and levels of engagement. Sure. I understand the additional hours, I and mean, that's quite clear. You could, you could count that. But I mean, the turnout, a, high, a very high turnout, was expected. It was anticipated that the turnout would be very high. It was expected that lots of new people would come onto the register. I mean, many of these things were anticipated. Um, and I'm presuming there was, a, there was preparation and additional resources were expected to be spent in advance of the referendum itself. So I'm just trying to. End. So I would assume that that was. A, I would assume that effectively the resources would have been available for what was anticipated. Are you saying it's over and above that again? Or, or not for it, EROs, no. Not, not, not the no. financial memorandum for CERA, the Scottish Independence Referendum Act, uh, did not actually, uh, although it stated that the government would meet the fees and expenses of electoral registration officers, the actual fees and charges order did not make any allocation to electoral registration officers. And really that is... Uh, the issue, I suppose. Well, on, on that point, then, I mean, are there, are there ongoing discussions with the government? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh -huh. so yeah, we're not anticipating any, any problem. We're just highlighting that these sorts of things add to the overall cost of the event. But that's, that's something we're discussing. So, so the matter's under discussion with Absolutely. the government. Absolutely. And you're assuming that, expecting it to come to a, a, a successful Absolutely. resolution. Absolutely. The, the key yes. issue no issue. here is that it was a late surge in oh. registration. Oh. A late surge. And it's last minute surge in registration with a deadline and equivalent surge in postal voting applications. And that's what the EROs had to deal with. Now, you, everybody knew it was going to be a big high turnout and you can plan for that, but the late surge was the problem. And that information has to be translated to the ROs contractors to print uh, uh, the postal vote uh, packs and so, and so forth and then in turn the registers on the day. And it's that late surge that was the key issue. And going forward, the issue for us is, for the next election, next May, what's the level of interest going to be in that election? And to what extent will we experience anything similar to the referendum and in turn the 2016 uh, Scottish Parliament elections? And that's what we have to build into our planning for the future. And that is trying to estimate turnout and surges. And you'll be a better person than me if you get that. I, I wasn't even going to try and <laughs> estimate the thunder. But I, I would assume, and maybe I'm wrong here, but I would assume, given the level of uh, individuals who are now on the register, and uh, no one moving on to individual registration, but effectively, 
has a lot of the work in a sense I'm over the hump in the because of the referendum so that anything in, in May 2015 or even May 2016 effectively must be lesser even if there's a high turnout than what has been expected. No I, I, I think the um, well certainly one of the points that Mary pointed out was emergency proxies mm -hmm. the, the, the law for the, re for the referendum the rules around emergency proxies was quite different to any other electoral event and that led to a huge volume of emergency proxies and a huge number that weren't valid uh, and that took an awful lot of work to deal with. Um, that won't be repeated in 2015 or 2016 unless the rules are changed because the existing rules for emergency proxies for UK and Scottish parliamentary elections are more business as usual. Uh, so in that regard we won't have that. Yes. I keep interrupting you. I don't mean to do that, but I do want to get Alec Johnston with his question before we get to the end of the session. Thank you very much. We've heard about all the problems. A high turnout and high demand. Uh, and looking down the list, there are some very impressive turnout figures. But I noticed that Dundee was under 80, Glasgow was only 75. Is there any reason why these two cities uh, were at the lower end of turnout figures? I suppose they were starting from a lower base. I would imagine that their, their turnout figures are generally at the lower end. So I know that they're actually, they, they think that this is, this is not, you know, there's no um, complacency and they would certainly like to get closer to the Scottish average. But an average is just that. It will have people who normally have high turnout areas, in areas who, who had over 90% this time and other areas where maybe the turnout is in the 30% range. So to get to 75 or 80 percent is, is, is really good performance as well. So it's where you're starting from, I think. Mm. Having explored the reasons for low turnouts when low turnouts were yes, the norm, yes. uh, one of the explanations I received was that there was a problem that existed a few years ago with, uh, uh, let's say, dead wood on the registers. Uh, there were people who had registered in more than one uh, electoral district. There were people who had moved on and their names were left on the register. Is there any extent to which these lower figures may expose a problem that continues to exist in these cities? The, uh, the, the rules around uh, what's termed dead wooding, which is when uh, a household doesn't make a canvas return for one year, well, their, their entry is carried forward into the following year for those electors in that household unless there's evidence to the contrary which is available to the mm -hmm. electoral registration officer. Now, that um, policy is consistent across Scotland. It, 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 it's in law and it's, it's practiced by EROs across Scotland. Uh, so we're very consistent about our approach to dead wooding. So would it be reasonable then to suggest that a city like Dundee that has a high student population or a city like Glasgow that might have a, a more mobile or transient population in certain areas would be the areas where there would be a higher proportion of that type of registration on the register? Um, all the cities suffer from the transient population, Aberdeen uh, City, um, mm -hmm. Edinburgh City. Ab Aberdeen was uh, over 80, but it was relatively low yes. as well. Uh, and, and, that, and that is normal, but I don't think that's, I don't think that's down to uh, a dead wooding arrangement uh, at all. I think that's just due to the, um, the, the, the makeup of the electorate in that city. I don't think it's due to the, the register being, if you like, inflated. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the issue. I think it's more that uh, just uh, the people who live in the cities don't yeah. t t seem to be engaged to the same extent as people who live So outside. these figures would be consistent with a historical pattern? Yes, yes, I think they are. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Listen, folks, I know there are members around the table who want to ask further questions. Forgive me, we're not going to have time to go into much more detail. I think there's one question that needs to be asked, though because we are here to look at the Smith Commission proposals to make sure that we also reflect that in the response we get in the four minutes we've got left. So I just wondered, in regard to the Smith report, what implications does it have for the Electoral Management Board? Um, it would be useful to, for us to hear that since we've got the circumstances here. Uh, I do think that um, we have no, no concerns about what's listed in the Smith Commission proposals as an EMB. We haven't obviously had time to look at it in any detail at all. Um, 
but I think they need to be read alongside the Electoral Commission report as well, which talks about the benefits of the EMB having a, a, a stronger um, statutory footing. Um, and particularly, I'm not, a, I'm not a power mad egomaniac who desperately wants a power of direction over all of my colleagues. As you would see from the referendum, I use the powers of direction very, very scarily. Scarily. <laughs> Sparingly, <laughs> was what I meant to say. Yes, brilliant. Um, but I, um, so it's not, it's not because we want to have those powers for it, you know, so that we, we use them all, all over the place. But they are important uh, where we are trying to get consistency. And I think it would, be, um, it would be helpful to read the Smith Commission alongside the Electoral Commission. Yeah, I was particularly interested in page 12 in that regard and about the statutory basis. So that's helpful to hear that. Yes. But if at some stage the Electoral Management Board would like to submit to us some further consideration on the Smith King proposal, proposals, that would be gratefully received. Um, with that being said, can I thank you very much? I know this has been a tight session this morning, but we've got a fair bit of information from it. If there are any questions that members have not had answered, we'll make sure, make, can you make sure they go to the clerk and we'll follow up these up in writing? Um, so I, in, in closing the meeting, can I just announce that the next meeting will be on Thursday the 8th of January, when we'll have evidence from representatives of the Electoral Commission themselves focusing on the report. And so can I wish members and those, those, everybody who is present here today then a very happy, happy festive break and I look forward to seeing you all in the new year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and um, we have enjoyed the session today so thank you very much and happy Christmas. <laughs>